Um, as we heard from this panel from One Earth yesterday, food and agriculture, critical lever for impact for our planet and for all of us. And here in our community, food and farming is a central part of our work in building a resilient community. And I come from energy, and so for me, I've been learning over the last few years, thanks to our food and farm leaders here in our community. And it's so inspiring and exciting what's possible in food and agriculture. And so you're going to be hearing from uh, incredible leaders uh, globally and locally in their communities on food and agriculture and what's possible. Leading the conversation is Kate Geegan. Kate is a nutritionist by training. She is a practicing nutritionist. She's an advisor to companies and to investors to connect big ideas to consumers. She's on the Sun Valley Institute Advisory Board and has been a curation partner throughout the planning of the part of the forum. I'm very grateful to Kate for her leadership. Please join me in welcoming Kate Geegan to the stage. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. Um, it's truly an honor to be a part of this session. I've spent 20 years as a registered dietitian, and really what's on the Nutrition Facts panel and what you choose to have for breakfast, those, those decisions link so much closer to the farm than ever before. And I have a 12 and 14 year old, and really the urgency of linking human health to planetary health and food system transformation has never been greater. So it's an honor for me to bring this, both keynotes as well as a panel on agriculture to really help you connect the dots. Um, and our keynote this morning, I'm so honored to welcome my friend and colleague, Robin O'Brien. Robin has helped transform food companies of every size, from startups to multinationals really to help them meet the needs of the changing metrics of 21st century consumers. Recognized as one of the world's most visionary voices in the food industry, she is vice president of Replant Capital, an impact investment firm deploying integrated capital from soil to shelf in order to reverse climate change. Robin was a founding team member of AIM and Invesco's first hedge fund of 100 million and a team member on their 20 billion dollar constellation fund. She was an advisor to Paul Hawkins Drawdown and has advised startups, banks, and multinationals while working with global CEOs and management teams in the food industry. She was published by Random House. Her book, The Unhealthy Truth in 2009, really set off a spark in the food world, in the food movement, and her TEDx talk has been viewed by millions and translated into multiple languages. You are in for such a treat this morning. Please help me welcome to the stage, Robin O'Brien. Thank you, Kate. Well, thanks you guys for having me. I grew up in Houston, Texas. Um, there was nothing about me that was environmentally aware. I was recruited by Exxon and Enron out of business school where I graduated on a full scholarship. Um, the vibe at Enron back in 1997 was getting pretty weird. So I quickly pivoted away from that and I went to work as Kate shared on a team that managed 20 billion in assets. I was the only woman on the team and so the guys said, you know, we're gonna have you cover the food industry and I was like, no, no. You know, I gave up Diet Coke every year for Lent. Um, I wasn't a foodie. Uh, my siblings would tell you that I could burn pancakes and I could burn noodles. So I tried to warn them that it probably wasn't the best fit, but as an analyst, I loved it because I learned their business models inside and out. And at the time, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, you know, it was very understandable. They were taking out all of the real ingredients and swapping in all of the artificial ingredients. And we were celebrating them because it was driving margins and profitability in the food industry. It wasn't until a few years later when we had had four children that I realized I didn't ask the right questions. I didn't ask what happened when you take all of those ingredients in combination, what happens to a pregnant mother or a child with autism or an uncle with cancer when he's eating all of those ingredients in combination. And I thought about those science classes we took as kids where you have these two different beakers with two different ingredients in them and they're totally fine separately but when you start to mix them together, they smoke and combust and all this weird stuff starts to happen. So my journey really began when I started to ask, you know, what happens? In the mid-1990s, we embraced an operating system introduced to us by a company I had never heard of when I was on 
the desk as a food industry analyst because the chemical industry guys covered Monsanto. But they introduced an operating system, which was a brilliant business model for them. You genetically engineer seed so that it can withstand increasing doses of your top seller Roundup. And revenue goes up as you sell the seeds, and it goes up as you sell more Roundup. And as they introduced that model, farmers had farmed one way for generations, for thousands of years. And in the 1990s, all of a sudden, that operating system changed. And farmers had to come back and repeat purchase those seeds, because those seeds that were genetically engineered to withstand increasing doses of Roundup had licensing fees attached to them, trait fees, royalty fees. And farmers started to have to pay those fees to Monsanto. So what's interesting to me is that share price took off. But our entire country has paid a price for that operating system. As Kate shared, I do a lot of public speaking. I work with a lot of these multinational companies. The first two that came at me were Kraft and Burger King, and boy, did they not want me talking. They did not want me talking when my book came out 10 years ago. And they did everything they could to discredit and marginalize my message. I don't think they fully understood that I had come from this very powerful financial background, from an MBA at Rice University, and then having worked on that desk. And I knew their models. You cannot change the food system on a quarterly earnings model. When these companies have to report in every three months on metrics from 1985, from 1975, and from 1965, you cannot change the food system on that quarterly earnings model. What's happening are the metrics have changed. The health of our children today are it's such an, a leading indicator. Two kids in every classroom have food allergies. One out of 10 kids has asthma. One in three American kids have what are called the four A's, allergies, autism, ADHD, and asthma. And cancer? Cancer is now the leading cause of death by disease in American children under the age of 15. One in two men are expected to get cancer in their lifetime in the United States, and one in three women. When I learned that data from the CDC, that one in two men are expected to get cancer, I thought, what are we waiting for? One in one? Why is this not the front page of every newspaper? We talk a lot about obesity, but one in two men? 50% of the room? So as I started working with these companies, in the beginning, they didn't want to hear what I had to say. And then in 2011, I was asked to give a TED Talk. I did not want to give that talk. I did not want to be on the stage by myself. When I had put the book out two years earlier with Random House, we had wrapped all kinds of attorneys around that thing. And that had been terrifying enough. The thought of taking a stage and standing in front of people and having to tell this story. But I realized that as toxic as this information can sometimes feel, that the knowledge is also a gift. And that if I could learn to share the information as the gift that it is, as a gift that it is to protect our families, to protect the people that we love, to protect our employees, to protect our country, then maybe we could start to talk about it in a different way. We have got to rethink capital. Capital is the most important ingredient in the food system. These companies are turning themselves inside out, trying to figure out how to better design these products. But if the capital they start with is toxic, the product's going to be toxic too. The model that we have embraced from the 20th century is extractive. There is absolutely nothing regenerative about the financial system. Nothing. And we spend $1.1 trillion a year on buybacks. $1.1 trillion to bribe shareholders to stick with us. That is coming at an incredible cost. It absolutely hollows out our economy. If you're spending $1.1 trillion on buybacks to prop up a share price, 
rather than R&D, innovation, supply chain, supply chain. You hear all these statistics about how 80% of households buy organic. You walk through that grocery store next door and there's plenty of organic. 75% of all categories in the grocery store now have something organic. 1% of U.S. farmland is organic. So how do you grow an industry when there is no supply chain? And when you're spending $1.1 trillion on buybacks, we are absolutely trashing the planet. So in the food industry, we have a debt addiction. It's not just the food industry. A lot of these share buybacks are actually financed with debt. Kraft Heinz is one of the greatest examples of a company that is absolutely upside down and backwards for the 21st century. They have taken on massive debt levels to continue to expand a part of their portfolio that nobody wants. And sure enough, in March, there was just an epic explosion. That stock absolutely cratered. The management team, 3G, Buffett, I'm not sure when the last time one of those guys maybe walked through a grocery store to get more than just a carton of milk. Or when the last time our members of Congress actually took a cart into a grocery store to do their family's weekly shopping to understand what we are dealing with as a country. What's fascinating to me is that while these same com companies are spending 1.1 trillion on share buybacks, 1.1 trillion on bribing their shareholders, 90% are also trying to do everything they can to scramble up and buy insurance against climate change. It is totally delusional to spend 1.1 trillion on buybacks, buy this insurance program, and do nothing in the middle there with your business model. Nothing to mitigate the risk no change of practices. Somehow, we're just going to keep paying off our shareholders and keep buying an insurance plan without changing the fundamentals. So as I thought about that, I thought, you know, what if Mother Nature was a publicly traded company? What if she had the ticker symbol, MN, and we were talking about MN Inc.? Who would she hire as her advertising agency? What kind of insurance program would she put in place? And I thought, you know, we're so focused on these quarterly earnings report. It's so delusional how focused we are on these quarterly earnings report in the face of the climate crisis we are witnessing. And the thing is, Mother Nature, MN Inc., she is reporting in quarterly. She is reporting in quarterly. August 2018, my hometown of Houston, Texas, went underwater with Hurricane Harvey. Quarterly earnings report. A few months later, California went up in flames. She issued another quarterly earnings report in November of 2018. Hurricane Michael in Georgia, that was another quarterly earnings report. And I realized, you know, maybe every time we read these headlines, Every single time we get a headline from Guam, Australia, the US, instead of just thinking about them as another storm, we've got to start realizing these are Mother Nature's quarterly earnings reports. It's another report. So as I thought about that, I thought, you know, okay, if I were to poll you guys, I'm pretty sure most people in this audience are buying something organic. We're so mindful of what we put into our shopping carts. We're good, we pat ourselves on the back about it, we feel really great about it. But what about our financial shopping carts? What about our portfolios? What funds do we hold? Do they hold Bayer, Monsanto stocks, Dow, Chemical? What's in that shopping cart? 62% of organic shoppers definitely believe that their investment should be aligned, but are they? 
do we have that visibility into our financial portfolios and shopping carts? When you step back and you realize that this is actually all related, from food to financials, it is so closely tied together. And when Bayer was trying to acquire Monsanto, it's a fascinating story. The outgoing CEO of Bayer actually wanted to acquire Unilever. He wanted to build a health model into Bayer. He was quickly tossed overboard, and the incoming CEO said, yeah, I'll acquire Monsanto, but here's the deal. We're going to finance this acquisition so we don't have to put it to a shareholder vote. Because he knew he would not have received shareholder approval. So it is one of the largest ever all-cash transactions. The story of the way that money closed on a single day is like a George Clooney movie. It is fascinating. And again, completely delusional. Because today there are over 13,000 lawsuits against Bayer because that signature product that they acquired in this operating system of genetically engineered Roundup Ready crops, three verdicts have come back in a row, declaring Monsanto guilty of negligence because that product has been linked to cancer. When I spoke in New Zealand last month, I had to share that our EPA in 1985 declared glyphosate a carcinogen. And six years later, in 1991, just before the introduction of genetically engineered crops, they reversed that position. Not a lot of people realize that. It's brutal to share this. I am named after a farmer in New Zealand who was diagnosed with cancer, and one of her daughters had cancer too. When she lost her husband and they were in their 40s, she leaned so heavily on glyphosate to manage that farm. Farmers are leaning on glyphosate to manage their farms. When I was in Nebraska a couple of weeks ago, we were standing on this guy's farm, and he was so excited because he's moving towards regenerative agriculture. And he was so proud. And he has three kids, his wife, you know, they're getting off this really toxic operating system of GMOs and glyphosate, and this whole portfolio of sides, herbicides and fungicides and insecticides. And I said, Steve, how's that field over there so green? And he said, well, I use glyphosate. And my face, he said, is that a dirty word? I said, well, yeah. I said, but you got to tell me, what do you have to do to not use that glyphosate? And he said, well, you see that piece of equipment over there? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I need one of those. And I said, how much is that? And he said, $350,000. And I said, where do you get health insurance? Because most people don't realize that farmers don't have health insurance plans, and they actually have to take an off-the-farm job to get health insurance for their families. And he leans in and he says, why do you think I'm county commissioner? He said, I filed my taxes, and I had $50,000 in my taxes that I was filing. And he said, my accountant said, how, how are you doing this with a family of five? And he said, you know, I get my insurance my health insurance from the county. And I thought, how is a guy that makes $50,000 a year supposed to finance a piece of equipment that costs $350,000 in order to break that grip that glyphosate has on his farm? I looked at this piece of machinery and I said, what about these discs? How much does each one of them cost? Because there are about 30 across the bottom. And he said, each one costs about $6,000. The farmers have been against this operating system. They know it's toxic. And yet they do not have the capital to finance their way out of it. Six million of our 911 million acres are organic in the United States. You cannot grow a healthy food system on 1%. And you cannot fix a broken food system with a broken financial system. 
So Patagonia decided they were going to give back some of the profits that they'd made of $10 million, and that's a start. But when you have $1.1 trillion in share buybacks, $10 million is not going to do it. Rose told me that it took them two years to rethink their 401k, because they realized, just like a lot of us have, that those portfolios are holding toxic assets. So we need to have radical transparency around the financial system the same way we've demanded it around food. If you look at the label in a grocery store, it is going to tell you everything you need to know about the most transparent products. Radical transparency is what the consumers for are asking for in the grocery store. We have got to demand that same transparency from our financial shopping carts. And just as we've created these new systems, you know, we had fossil fuels, and now we've got solar and wind. We had conventional ag, and now we have organic. It is not radical to say, we've got this really toxic financial system. We need regenerative finance. We need something different. And for those that don't believe that this is possible, it's too big, you know, these banks, it's too big to fail. This is such a great example. Blockbuster once had 100% market share. And there was a little company called Netflix that came to them and they said, hey, let's collaborate. Let's figure out a way that we can partner together because we have a system where people can watch videos online. And the Blockbuster CEO said, who in the world is going to want to watch videos online? <laughs> they had the opportunity to acquire Netflix for $50 million after they had gone public for $4.8 billion. The next generation is coming with $22 trillion in assets, and they are not going to buy into a toxic operating system. The financial system is the next one that is ripe for disruption. You have the opportunity to be in front of it or behind. And Silicon Valley has always invested in software. The last 20 years has been all about software. It is time now to invest in hardware in that infrastructure. Capital is coming. We've seen this incredible transformation to plant-based. 16 billion in assets in the last 10 years. 13 of that 16 billion has been in the last two. But we're going to have to rethink every single model. When Branson's office reached out, it was a young guy who said, you know, nobody's talking about food here, Robin. We're travel and transport and leisure. And I said, you know, I get it. But you guys are also pumping so much carbon into the atmosphere. So imagine if this guy were to start Virgin Farms. Imagine if he were to start Virgin Farms. That's the opportunity in front of all of us. So thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. And I look forward to talking to you guys afterwards. Thank you, Robin. That was incredible. And what a beautiful way to help us really think about the new operating system of food and all of those components. Um, we're going to shift lenses a little bit from the finance piece and sort of the macro to on farm, because of course, that's the hardware of where things start um, in the food system. So I'd love to introduce our next speaker, John Piotti. Um, I had the pleasure of hiking with John here a couple days ago. Uh, John has worked at the forefront of sustainable agriculture since the early 1990s, first in Maine and now nationally. In 2016, John became president of the American Farmland Trust, bringing new energy to this storied organization that helped create, really create, the conservation agriculture movement that has gained so much momentum recently, but they were there from day one. Under John's leadership, AFT has engaged in the most comprehensive study of American land use ever conducted, helping secure also an additional 200 million a year in the farm bill for federal funding for agricultural conservation easements and has launched new initiatives that advance restorative farming practices combat climate change, and support the next generation of farmers. 
prior to joining AFT, John served as president of the Maine Farmland Trust, which during his tenure became recognized as one of the most innovative and impactful farm support groups in the nation. He also served in the Maine State Legislature where he chaired the Agriculture Committee and was later elected House Majority Leader. So please join me in welcoming John Piotti to the stage. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's always great to share information with creative and thoughtful people who uh, care deeply about the future. And I'm always excited to talk about agriculture. Some of you may know American Farmland Trust because of our iconic bumper sticker, but you may not know much else. For 40 years, we've been working on the critical issues which really will determine the future of our society and our planet. Now, our planet is in a climate crisis, and farming is one of the few hopeful solutions. Farming done right has the promise to capture and hold significant amounts of carbon. Now, those of you who are familiar with farming and agricultural policy today may be surprised to know what didn't exist in 1980 when AFT was formed. At that point in time, there were only a handful of farms that had been protected with agricultural conservation easements, which is the tool that you use to make sure that land will forever be available for farming. Um, there was no conservation agriculture community or community of practice. There was no recognition of agricultural easements in federal law. There was no federal tax donation for providing an easement. There was no federal money at all for farmland protection, and there was only limited sporadic federal programming that supported better farming practices. In fact, the part of the Farm Bill, the conservation title that deals with better farming practices, didn't even exist. Now, having a conservation title in the Farm Bill might not sound like a big deal, but it is. The Farm Bill is easy to criticize, and I'm someone who does that all the time, but the conservation title is an exception. Since 1985, it has provided $115 billion to farmers to help them build soil health, save water, reduce runoff, and sequester carbon. Now, we haven't yet done nearly enough, but I hate to think of where agriculture would be today if those steps hadn't been taken, if that groundwork had not been laid over the last 35 years. AFT made all of this happen. Now, I can brag about AFT because I wasn't there then, but I think any objective observer would say that what AFT did was truly extraordinary. We launched the conservation agriculture movement, a broad label under which regenerative agriculture falls. It's an impressive legacy. It's advanced unprecedented federal and state policy change and has created great opportunities for innovation amongst farmers. But enough about the fat past. We're here to talk about the future. The challenge of our day is climate, and farming has a pivotal role to play. AFT is not alone in advancing this, but we have a longer track record and a deeper knowledge than others. And perhaps more importantly, we have a broader perspective of agriculture than many other groups. And I think on the issue of climate, that's critical. Because agriculture's potential solutions go beyond just better farming practices, as essential as those are. AFT is the only national group that takes a truly holistic view to agriculture. From our earliest days, we have been about the land, about the practices that you employ on that land, and about the people who steward that land, our farmers and ranchers. But we're going to start with farming practices, because that's what everyone's talking about, and for good reason. Because our soil can hold up to three times more carbon than our atmosphere. Now, you'll hear about regenerative agriculture, as we're talking about today, but you'll hear other terms as well. You'll hear about restorative agriculture. You'll hear about climate-smart agriculture. You'll hear about carbon farming. 
And these terms are not exactly the same, but there's a lot of overlap, and I don't want us to get bogged down on the nuances. The basic concept is the same, and that is to utilize farming practices that maximize environmental benefits, including building soil health and sequestering carbon. Now, what are these practices? There's a lot, but some of them are no-till or low-till, active use of cover crops, active use of crop rotations, things called alley cropping, on the livestock side, intensive rotational grazing, use of silvopasture, and I could go on and on. These practices are not new. AFT and others and many enterprising farmers have been using them for, for decades. That's not to say that new technology isn't playing an important role. Precision agriculture, in particular, is a tool that elevates these practices to new levels of efficiency. So what technology is doing is allowing us, in some ways, to accelerate adoption. But the biggest change is not in technology. It's really in our outlook. In the 1980s, when, ni when AFT began working on these practices, our focus was on reducing runoff, and reducing erosion in building soil health um, in order to increase productivity and resiliency, not carbon sequestration per se. But we now know that these same practices are the most cost-effective ways of taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it in the soil. Beyond that, we now know that we must put carbon back into the soil if we have any chance of meeting the Paris Climate Accords. Um, the clear finding of the IPCC report that you heard about yesterday, a clear finding is that um, we need to go beyond reducing emissions. We need to sequester carbon. And that report was really a game changer. It's the reason why so many people and organizations are now talking about regenerative ag. Now, farming provides an extremely hopeful solution because farming gives us a chance to simultaneously grow nutritious food and help restore the planet, and that's truly hopeful. But we do need to be careful here and to avoid blind optimism. And I'll give you one example that sort of a factor that complicates the calculus here, and that's the interplay between how we farm and how much farmland we have. Though it's wonderful that farming can both grow food and provide essential environmental services, we must remember that we cannot maximize food production and environmental benefits on a single parcel. We can optimize. We can find the right balance. But we can't maximize both. If the goal is to manage the land for maximum food production, we will occur some sacrifice in environmental benefits, and vice versa. And in this way, farming practices is directly related to farmland loss. With every acre of farmland that we lose, we are not only losing land that could be used to provide greater environmental benefits through regenerative practices, but we put more pressure on the remaining land to be farmed more intensely, because the amount of food demand hasn't changed, right? So it's a double hit. It's a reinforcing downward spiral. This wouldn't be such a big deal if we weren't losing farmland so fast. But in the last 20 years, we have lost 31 million acres of farmland in this country. That is the equivalent of all the farmland in Iowa. Now, some people are alarmed by this. I'm certainly in that camp. But there are a lot of intelligent people who aren't. And here are some of the things that I, that I hear from them. I hear, well, we'd have plenty of land if we just didn't eat meat or if we just didn't make use land for growing a uh, product for biofuels. I hear that, well, in the future, we're not going to need the farmland to grow food because it's all going to be grown elsewhere, in vertical farms or whatever, which are very important, but not a full answer. Or I hear, well, we can significantly increase our productivity through technology. Now, I have a solid response to all of these, but I don't have time to go into it, but um, you can ask me later. I'm here all week. Um, but I will touch on that last item of increased productivity. 
society has seen huge increases in productivity um, in the last hundred years, the so-called Green Revolution. And some people think that that trend line can continue. But we must remember that increased production came at a significant cost, including the skyrocketing increase in the use of petroleum-based fertilizers. Not exactly what I'd call a climate-smart answer. Now, I have no doubt that we can increase productivity, but I question how much we can increase productivity if simultaneously we are trying to pursue regenerative practices as we must. And this is because, as noted earlier, as you intensify food production, you limit opportunities for environmental benefits. Now, don't get the wrong idea. I do think that we'll see productivity increases through technology. I also think that technology is going to augment our food supply through strategies like vertical farming. Um, that's all good, but I doubt it will be enough to feed the future of a population not if we are continuing to lose farmland. If we don't stop farmland loss, we would need an unrealistically high and an environmentally unsound increase in food production to outpace the demand of a growing population eating an adequate diet. So simply put, we can't risk to lose the farmland we have. In fact, let me take this argument one step further and ask this very provocative question. Do we have enough farmland today? Now, you may respond, well, of course we do. After all, in the U.S., we grow far more food than we need. But let's think about the farmland we would lose if, for instance, there was ample vegetation along every waterway to filter runoff and keep our rivers and streams clean. What if we utilized adequate crop rotations and cover crops everywhere? What if the marginal land that's out there that is now farmed was restored to native prairie or woodland or wetlands? What if we were serious about having farming be carbon neutral? What if we took it to the next level and had farming actually be a significant carbon sink, which is needed because we know there are some economic sectors that are never going to be carbon neutral. If we did all of those things, would we have enough farmland to provide the environmental services we need today? And, and wait, there's more. Because I'm only talking about the United States here. And of course, these are global issues. And they're dynamic issues, right? Because there's a growing population, and the impacts of climate change include shifting weather patterns and increased temperature and reduced rainfall in some areas and rising sea level, all of which on their own is going to take even more farmland away. So how much farmland do we need? This is a really basic question that has gone unanswered. Not because people haven't thought about it, because it's more complicated than you may think. But AFT, I'm happy to say, is positioned to address this. It's truly the next logical step in a major project that we've been undertaking for five years. All we need is a few more years and a few more million dollars, and we do take checks. <laughs> but even if the results of that research are a ways off, there is one thing I can tell you now with confidence, and it's this. Long before we run out of the agricultural land that we are going to need to feed us, we are going to run out of enough agricultural land to provide the environmental services that we need to restore our planet. In fact, it's quite possible we are already extremely close to this tipping point. We just don't know it. Now, my point in all of this has been to show how our ability to advance regenerative farming practices is directly dependent on the amount of farmland we retain. But the connections don't stop there, right? The next critical piece involves the farmers and ranchers who work that land. And even if you retain adequate farmland, the system breaks down if we don't have enough people to work that land. 
Now, this is becoming a huge issue across the globe. In the U.S., AFT estimates that 40% of the farmland will transition in the next 15 years due simply to the age of the farmland owners. Where are we going to find these new farmers and ranchers, folks willing and able to do the work? And if we don't find them, how much of that land risks being lost to other uses, further escalating the trend in farmland loss that is already too great? Now, fortunately, our country is full of people who want to farm. They just need help, and that's why AFT provides a lot of services. And a quick important aside here. Often the only way to remove one of the critical barriers for beginning farmers is to increase the amount of land that is protected under an agricultural conservation easement, because that will lower the cost and make it affordable. It's another instance where the issues of land and people are connected. It's a system. So what does all this mean? It means that to combat, to combat climate change, we desperately need to transition to regenerative practices. But regenerative practices by themselves won't guarantee anything. We will never realize our goal unless we have sufficient farmland and sufficient number of farmers who are working that property in the right way. Yet there is realistic hope. We have, over the last 40 years, developed the tools to protect farmland, advance environmentally sound farming practices, and keep farmers on the land. We are not implementing those tools at the level we need to, but we know what to do. We just need to accelerate our work. Now, both public policy and markets have a role to play here. I've worked in the trenches of agricultural policy for over 25 years, and I believe that we are poised for transformational change. And it's because of the severity of the crisis and the fact that an increasing number of people care about farming, care about agriculture, and see the connection to climate change. And when it comes to environmental markets, and no time to go into the details, but I think we stand ready for some major breakthroughs. So government action and market forces can together provide a way to compensate farmers and ranchers, not just to grow food, but for the critical environmental services that they are providing. And ultimately, that is what is going to accelerate us towards widespread adoption of regenerative practices. Finally, I am uh, I'm optimistic that AFT's next wave of research is going to make a difference. Knowing how much farmland we need, knowing where that tipping point is, can be a catalyst for change, because compelling data can drive action. I'm going to end with a very short and short and sweet, I hope, video that we made a year ago with the release of our first Farms Under Threat report. Now, farmland loss is not a topic that sounds optimistic, but as I noted, there are reasons to be hopeful. We have the tools. We just need to rally the resources to make it happen, and you can help with that. The United States is blessed with some of the richest farmland and ranch land in the world. This land grows our food, supports our rural communities, and contributes a trillion dollars a year to our economy. Well-managed farmland controls floods, suppresses fires, and protects our water and wildlife. And farmland provides a unique tool to combat climate change, a way to sequester carbon through natural means that improve soil health. Our future depends on having enough farmland to both feed us and to restore our planet. Yet our farmland is disappearing. We are losing it to expanding cities and suburbs and to single-family homes built on large lots in rural areas. In 20 years, we've lost 31 million acres, as much farmland as exists in the entire state of Iowa. That's twice the amount previously thought. That's three acres a minute, and the loss is irreversible. But there's hope. Since 1980, American Farmland Trust has led a movement of agricultural land trusts and state programs that have together saved 6.5 million acres. Clearly, much more is needed, but the tools are now in place to do more. With your help, we can save the land that sustains us. Learn more about our farms under threat and join the cause. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, John. That was wonderful. Um, as a dietitian and nutritionist, I always marvel at the connections, how I at the same we're time we're getting these lines of science around the oh, benefits okay. of on-farm restorative regenerative ag. They're linking directly to human health. On-farm resilience is human resilience, whether it's soil, biodiversity, microbiome, cover crop. Um, the connections are really immediate and real and not just sort of something further away from people. So it's, it's a really exciting time where everything is accelerating on these connections. Um, I'd love to bring Robin and John back up for just a quick chat to delve a bit deeper in um, for both of you. Testing, is the mic on? If not, I'll stay. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so Robin, I wanna start with you. Um, I, I'm always so moved by your talk of how to transform the food system, we have to transform the financial system. And I wanted to ask, what metrics do you believe should be employed when investors are looking at investments going forward? What should I say when I call my person after hearing you speak? So what you measure matters, obviously. And if we have the wrong metrics, then we're not gonna move forward. So, you know, one of the things I think about now is, especially as I listen to these CEOs talk about, you know, the challenges in their supply chain, supply chain finance, how they can convert their farmland. General Mills is a great example. In March, they announced that they wanted to convert yeah. a million acres to regenerative. Rinska, and I said, well, how'd that nice go? Nice to meet you. I'm and they said, we were Morgan. hoping to get 25 farmers in oh, the first wow, three thanks. years. They got 180 farmers signing up in the first 24 hours. So Incredible. you think about that. You think about that. Like they're introducing a new system and nothing is in place to capture that system. So the metrics I think about are, you know, how much of your farmland is organic? What programs do you have in place to convert farmland from conventional in this toxic operating system to regenerative and organic? What's the cost of capital for converting that farmland to regenerative organic practices? What capital do you have in place to provide to your suppliers and your farmers if these guys are going to try to refinance those operating systems on their farm? How is a guy like Steve going to have the access to capital to purchase the equipment or lease the equipment that he may need to convert that farmland? So Wall Street needs to get smart fast. And, you know, we've had a lot of conversations of, you know, I think John and I should probably be in New York City having these <laughs> meetings and these presentations actually in New York City because that's what has to happen. They'll get there. And probably the greatest example of that is when Annie's decided to do an IPO back in 2014. They used the ticker symbol BNNY because that all they made were those little cheddar bunnies and mac and cheese. Wall Street got the most excited about that IPO than almost any IPO that entire year. That technology of organic mac and cheese is what Wall Street got excited about. So it's there. It's sort of incubating a little bit. And I think we need to get in front of them and have these conversations in New York. Yeah, I agree. Huge opportunity. John, when you and I were hiking the mm -hmm. other day, we were talking about how there's, you know, innovation, mm -hmm. there's technology, but you said, let's not forget about policy. Absolutely. And I would love to hear if you could share just a couple thoughts about what's happening, both mm -hmm. at the sort of local and federal level, right, with right. policy to help us unlock some of this restorative, sure. regenerative sure. agriculture. Yeah. Well, the primary vehicle for federal policy is a single bill called the Farm Bill, which probably many of you know about, um, which comes up basically every five years. And we just had one that was passed last December. So at AFT, we're gearing up for the next one. And, and I, I don't think I'm being... I've been working on farm bills since the one in 1995, <laughs> but I don't think I'm being overly optimistic when I, when I say, or naive, I'm not being naive, when I say that I really think this next farm bill could be something different. And um, so I'm hopeful for that. But that is five years off. And what AFT and other groups are thinking about is what do we do now? And the real place for action right now is the states for two reasons. One, because state policy often drives federal policy. We prove that things work at the state level and then they get adopted. But the second reason is we now have 26 states that are part of the U.S. Climate Alliance. And a big focus is on natural solutions. AFT was the first ag organization to be par an impact partner for the, for the Climate Alliance. And all of those states have to come up with, by the 
end of 2020 with a plan and policies for them to do their part to meet the Paris Accords. And natural solutions, including what we can do with regenerative agriculture, is part of it. So the real policy action right now is working with those states, both to bring real benefit immediately and to set up models that can be embraced in the next Farm Bill. Excellent. And, and almost hits on that additional point of revitalizing rural, rural economies, which is really a bipartisan place right now. It, it certainly <laughs> should. I mean, uh, I don't know how many of you know it, um, but the farm economy is, is struggling for a host of reasons, some political, some economic. Um, but farmers are really in tough straits, and we, uh, we could spend an hour talking about just dairy issues and how uh, there are dairy farmers committing suicide in waves right now. It's phenomenal. And you look at the damage that's occurred in the plains with the floods. I mean, it's, it's, it's devastating. Well, I want to thank you both. John and Robin will be around today to continue the conversation if anyone has questions. Um, but thank you both so much, Robin, thank you for so coming, much. and John for the support of the Institute mm -hmm. of American Farmland Trust. Your collaboration support is so wonderful and powerful as we really seek to accelerate moving towards the future we want. So Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Okay, we're going to shift gears now to f finish up the food and agriculture session this morning to an incredible panel. I am so honored to be a part of this conversation this morning. These are really the folks doing the work, threading the needle from the soil to the customer and that whole chain. So we're really going to discuss um, uh, clo more closely, how, did how does this all link together from on farm and soil right up through when you go and order in a restaurant? So with that, I'd like to introduce our panel, our outstanding panel, um, Dr. Christine Morgan. Come on up, everybody. We'll get everyone seated and then I'll make introductions. How about that? We have a nice cozy panel. Okay, great. So we're starting this way with introductions. This is Dr. Christine Morgan. She is the Chief Science Officer of the Soil Health Institute. And next to Christine, we have Noah uh, Dyke. Uh, and he is the Executive Director of Carbon 180. And then next to Noah is Dana Gross. Dana is another local Sun Valley Haley resident. Um, she's the Senior Corporate Engagement Advisor of Global Agriculture for the Nature Conservancy. And she started her career just down the road at the Silver Creek Nature Preserve. It's gorgeous mm -hmm. if you have time to go and see it. Um, and that really led her to work with local farmers uh, and surrounding ranchers and then she transitioned to become involved with um, companies working in Idaho, such as um, General Mills and Miller Coors. And now you are working with global multinational corporations, at helping them identify where they can have the greatest impact, bringing the technical expertise of the Nature Conservancy to help them translate that from the ground up. And then next to Dana is Bonnie Lay. She is AI for Earth project manager at Microsoft. And if you were lucky enough to hear Bonnie speak yesterday, just fascinating about how AI is helping us unlock and accelerate some of these things. And then Renska Lind. Um, Renska is general partner of First Course Capital, an early stage investment fund, investing in seed and series A rounds of uh, food and ag companies. And she's also a co-founder of Food System 6, which is an incredible accelerator, really providing, um, it's a nonprofit accelerator to support mission-driven entrepreneurs as they transform how we grow, produce, and distribute food. And then finally, we have Jin Yang, fellow transplant to Idaho. Um, he is currently the culinary director of the Boise Co-op. But in 2015, he was the Portland Iron Chef winner, who, while he was in Portland, <laughs> ran Bamboo Sushi, which was the world's first certified sustainable sushi restaurant. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so, thank, thank you. So, Christine, I'd love to start with you. Um, can you share with us? Oh, let me get you the clicker. <laughs> share with us, Christine. What is the Soil Health Institute, and um, what science are you witnessing around carbon sequestration, soil practices, from your perspective? Okay. Well, thank you for having me here. It's very exciting um, to be a soil scientist and get to speak to such a, a crowd with a broad array of interests and experiences. Um, so I am a soil scientist, and it's so exciting <coughs> to get to work on soil and soil health because it is so important to uh, the existence of our society. And uh, so I put up a couple of things around soil health it's, that maybe we don't always think about. When we think about soil, I think, it's very easy to understand the connection between soil and food security, and maybe even soil and water security. You know, soil cycles water. When the, when the rain falls out of the sky, it hits the soil, and it either goes off of the soil into our surface water, or it goes through the soil, and the soil filters it and changes its chemistry and cleanses it for our consumption later. Uh, it also provides uh, water to plants, right? So that gets back to food security as plants are making um, a photosynthesis and, and making food for us. But soil health is also connected to human health and through food security and clean water. But also soil has a microbiome just like humans and all living things have a microbiome. So soil is living and soil is taking care of waste products all the time. You know, we're, we're always doing something to our soil and adding things to the soil, you know, whether it just be dead animals or whatever, and the soil is cycling that. And the soil also takes care of some of the organic compounds that we put on it, and the microbes eat it and transform it into something useful. But soil is also important for biodiversity. You know, a very small amount of soil has a huge amount of microbes, and we, don't, we can culture such a tiny, tiny fraction of what's in the soil we don't even know. We know more about space than we know about what's in our soil. And most importantly, based on what we've been talking, you've heard so much about it uh, yesterday and today, is soil is vital in climate change in two ways. Soils mitigate climate change, and we've talked about carbon sequestration. Yesterday, there was a lot of talk about carbon sequestration and, and, and you know, that agriculture was filling that gap. Soil is filling that gap of carbon sequestration. But also, climate change mitigation. In Texas, which is where I'm from, we have had such giant rainfalls. In the Midwest, there's been so much rain that we can't even, farmers can't even plant their crops. And if your soil is healthy, when the rain comes and when these huge rainfalls happen that are very intense, we want the soil to stay where it is. We don't want the soil to get into the water. And we also want the soil to have the opportunity to infiltrate and filter our water. So uh, climate change, is a big component of soil health, and soil health has a role in both adaption and mitigation. So I just wanted to show you some pictures now of soil, because I love soil, and I think that's <laughs> the most interesting thing about it. Um, but first, let's start with the definition. Soil health is the capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem, and it sustains plants, animals, and humans. And you can see in this picture, this I think soil looks like cake. And, you know, it's beautiful, and it has these aggregates, and microbes are, are in there. I mean, it's this wonderful, healthy uh, home for so many living things. And we can manage this soil. So here is a picture in North Dakota of a field. On one side, uh, it has a different kind of grazing management than the other side. You can see on the right-hand side, there's a lot more vegetation than on the left. And then if we look at the soil, and it doesn't show up really great here, but you can see the soil on the right is much darker on top. It has more carbon in it, and it's from the management. So we affect how the soil sequesters carbon and how it functions in our ecosystem just with decisions on management. So soil cycles nutrients. Here is an example of a good management system called no-till. So we're not disturbing the soil, and all the leftovers from the crops of the previous are on top of the soil, helping arm it against heavy infiltration and also feeding those microbes. Here's an example of the soil and its importance in cycling water. On one side, you see puddles and just water sitting there and probably a lot of soil erosion. And on the other side, we've had cover cropping, which is another soil health-promoting practice, 
and no tillage, and the water has, has gone through the soil. Here's a picture of the, what can happen uh, if the soil isn't armed. And here's a picture of what can happen when the soil is armed. And there's even a blow up. See how crystal clear that water is? That's how we want our soil to function for us. And lastly, I had to throw in a data slide. I'm a scientist. <laughs> I, I think I probably shouldn't have done this because now I don't have time to explain it. But what this shows is there's that. So on the, on the y-axis, we have the water held by the soil. And some water is available to the plants and some isn't. And that beige component are, is where uh, water is available to soil. So the bigger the beige is, the more water for the soil. And on the x-axis is carbon. So what this shows us is as we increase carbon in the soil, the soil holds more water that's available to the plant. And this is really important for climate change mitigation or ad adaptation that we, you know, we're having more extreme rainfalls and more extreme drought. And now more than ever, we need the soil to function for us. And that's what we work on in the Soil Health Institute. We drive, we, we're trying to get soil managers to adopt soil health promoting practices for the benefit of farm families and the benefit of society. Wonderful, <laughs> thank you. When I was chatting with Christine about how to introduce her, she said, just say that I love soil. <laughs> and now I really see that to be true, so that was <laughs> wonderful. Um, next is Noah, and Noah, I have to say, I was intrigued when I looked at the Carbon 180 website, you ask a, a really profound what if question. What if, instead of seeing carbon as a liability, and as a waste product, we saw it as an asset and a resource? And I think that's a really profound shift of thinking that, at least for myself, really stopped me. So can you share with us what innovative technologies and practices you're seeing with regards to agriculture, and how can that help us transform at scale? Yeah, of course, and, and thank you again. It's, uh, at Carbon 180, we're a nonprofit based in the Bay Area, and our mission is to build an economy that actually sequesters more carbon than it emits which is an incredibly audacious goal, we understand, but one that all of the climate scientists now recognize is essential if we actually want to tackle climate change. And part of sequestering more carbon than we emit is figuring out what to do with all of that carbon when we take it out of the atmosphere. Forests are a, a logical place to start. Soils are another huge opportunity, as are big industrial technology. Capture CO2, turn it back into building materials, or even just burying it back underground where those fossil fuels came from. What I didn't realize before starting this organization about five years ago, though, was that soils are an enormous sink of carbon. There are three times as much carbon in soils than in all of the atmosphere. And we've actually lost a lot of carbon from those soils. That over the past 10,000 years or so of human agriculture, we've lost nearly 10 times as much soil as we emit in carbon emissions every year. So the, the just back of the envelope math shows that this is a huge opportunity. Now I think the real challenge that we look at as an organization is how do we actually get farmers to stop doing these destructive farming practices and start doing practices that start to rebuild soil and recarbonize that soil. So, just show of hands, are there any farmers in the audience? It's kind of hard for me to see. Yeah, I, I see a handful. Uh, how about people who have eaten food at some point today? <laughs> exactly, so more, more hands show up there. And that, that to me is what's really a, a huge opportunity here, is that farmers know that they're, they're feeding the world, that they can do things to uh, actually save the planet as well, but in the United States today, it's something like 2% of uh, Americans are actually farmers, which makes it very challenging for individuals to think about how we can change our behavior. But we do all eat food every day, and so there's some really important levers that we can think about when we want to actually put carbon back into soils. Whether this is uh, figuring out how to plant different types of varietals, use different types of soil amendments that sequester carbon, or simply incorporate trees into our, our farming ecosystems in a way that it provides not just carbon benefits, but all of these soil health and, 
and ecological benefits. And I think one of the biggest things that we've learned from the business side is that there is an opportunity for farmers to at least make as much money as they currently are using conventional agriculture in some of these soil health promoting and carbon sequestering practices. But it won't happen overnight that farming is a very delicate uh, system, the margins are very thin, so without the, the resources and support to actually make those changes, they're not gonna happen quickly. And so where we focus as an organization is on changing policy on one end, but also on working with businesses to try and create the types of consumer demand. And right now there is no extra premium for carbon sequestering food. I mean, I can't go to the, a restaurant or the grocery store and know which of my food is farmed in a way that sequesters carbon. We're starting to see that change. Uh, Annie's and General Mills on one side have started to label some of their products with regenerative labels. Patagonia Provisions is starting to think about this. Even McDonald's is thinking about how they can source more regenerative, regeneratively farmed beef. And so it, it's a, a transition that's starting slowly. But what we see is that the policy landscape, especially in DC, is really, really important for how farmers make decisions. And I think it's really essential that we, um, we start to think about how we move that policy infrastructure to simply remove regulatory barriers that are preventing farmers from doing things that would sequester carbon, but are for disadvantaged in that regulatory context. We're really just at the beginning of all of this as well. We want to see every farm, a carbon farm at the end of the day, one that is sequestering carbon on net. And part of that journey is, is figuring out how to get the, these policy shifts so that we can provide incentives and create the, the markets for these products. And to, to get back to that original prompt, it's really thinking about not just how do we impose a cost on farmers, but thinking about how we can as a society, reward farmers not just for the food that they grow, but for all of the, the ecosystem services, including carbon sequestration that they provide. So. And bring customers along with you on exactly. that journey, which yeah. we will definitely hear about <coughs> later on the panel with Jin. Um, excellent, Noah, thank you. So now let's widen the lens a little bit. We've been talking about carbon, restorative, <coughs> on-farm practices, and I wanna shift gears with Dana your work with the Nature Conservancy. Dana, what are you seeing? How are corporations that are doing traditional industrial ag at scale, how are they looking at this whole opportunity and how are they navigating it? Um, what challenges do they have, but what opportunities do they see, especially as regards sort of nonprofit private collaboration? As these groups try to make these shifts but might need some technical support of, of these other groups like yeah. the TNC. Um, uh, perfect, so just to clarify, most of the companies that I work with, large global companies, don't actually do the agriculture themselves, right? So the products that you see, the Cheerios in the grocery store, there's probably three or four steps to get to the grocery store before, um, before you see it. Um, so the agriculture is disconnected from the company, which is, creates a huge complexity in itself. So if you wanna make changes, on the ground and you're a company and you've got three steps to get to your farmer, that's a challenge in itself. Um, so I thought what I'd do is just talk about TNC a little bit, the Nature Conservancy, and give an example of a company. Funny, General Mills keeps coming up, so I'll use General Mills again. Um, this was not planned, but um, to kind of talk through how companies have, um, have taken this transition. So the Nature Conservancy, we are first and foremost interested in conservation around the world for nature, for people, for communities. We are farmers and ranchers, we're landowners, so we have a very practical view on what works and what doesn't work. Um, we work with, um, like I said, everybody, large companies, we work with landowners. General Mills is an interesting example because about 15 years ago, um, the way that they got started on their sustainability journey was they had black helicopters in their parking lot. So they came to work one day and Earth First was there and they realized, you know, oh my gosh, maybe we should do something. And so the next day, they internally hired their first chief sustainability officer, and his job was to figure this whole puzzle out. 
So they started as most companies do in their four walls, changing light bulbs, recycling, doing all of that stuff and realized that that just wasn't cutting it. Um, so they started looking at their supply chain. And you look at General Mills supply chain is huge and global. Um, they started sending out surveys to farmers to try and figure out who they were and what they were doing. And then every other company did that. And it was incredibly frustrating, I think, for the farmers and everybody involved. Um, and so they came to the Conservancy and other partners to really figure out where can we have the biggest bang for the buck? Where should we be focusing? They identified about eight places around the world, one of them the Snake River Plain, and then honed in on what should we be doing in this place for water quantity, for soil health, who should we be working with, what projects should we be doing, and really, really targeted specific farmers in specific places and suppliers and got them involved. And so um, General Mills is not perfect. It's not the perfect story, but that's sort of the, the journey that companies have come on. Um, there's lots of challenges. The biggest one I I'd say is scale. Like how do you take those pilot projects and scale them? Adoption of practices is expensive. Um, and so nailing that scale question is, is, a, is a tough one, but there's a ton of opportunities. Um, creativity, I think, is one. Innovation, finance, all these really exciting ways to get farmers involved. Um, and really quickly, one really cool project we have going in Arizona is um, there was a river that was essentially running dry. Um, alfalfa was being grown. We wanted the people to grow barley instead, and they wanted to, but there was no market. So the Nature Conservancy started a joint venture and bought, um, bought a malt facility, and now we're um, in the brewery business. <laughs> so I think there's a ton of really great creative examples that companies are involved with that can really move this along. That's great, thank you. Yeah. As a nutritionist, I would probably do something different with barley than brew beer. <laughs> 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 Wonderful, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, Bonnie, uh, you have over 300 partnerships at Microsoft using AI, with agriculture being one of these four critical areas that you've identified as key to transforming and building a sustainable future. So really speaks to the power of this pillar. What are you seeing in your partner organizations with regards to food and farming? We'd love to hear how they're using and leveraging AI to accelerate some of these changes. Absolutely. So I get to save the great agriculture stories that I wanted to tell yesterday for today. So that's mainly what I'm going to do with you with the little time I have. For us, at the very, very basis of every work that we do, we think it's incredibly important to get the data and then the analyses derived from that data into the hands of people who are making the decisions on the ground. And so in the agriculture space specifically, we want to help make sure that farmers have the information, have the data about what is happening directly on their farms so that they can make better decisions for both their own profit as well as for um, greater sustainability as part of their practices. And so just as one example, um, Farm Beats is a program that we work with, and they work on deploying low-cost sensors for farmers throughout their farm, and there's a number of different algorithms that they run to help patch in um, areas and make predictions even where there isn't a sensor deployed. And what's actually really cool is that you, could, you think oftentimes farms are located in rural areas where you may actually not have Wi-Fi connectivity, and so how do you get all these sensors to communicate to a central system and get to like a central dashboard where the farmers can make uh, decisions? And so this is really cool. Um, what they've been able to do is uh, leverage a type of um, technology called TV white space. And so instead of doing the typical broadband LTE connectivity, they actually tap into unused TV channels, which could tra those waves could travel over much further distances um, and are unused by the TV channels for their own buffering purposes. And so by tapping into that unused network, you're actually able to help people in rural areas be able to have connectivity and for the farm specific purposes, be able to collect all of that data and actually have it in a centralized repository and make decisions off of that. Um, and so that's, Farm Beast is a great solution for when you're looking at a specific farm and what you could do on that farm. Another interesting example is like what, could, what you could do if you actually aggregate data across a number of different farms and start finding trends and sort of interesting um, ways to help the industry move forward. And so we have another partner called Ag Analytics. Um, it's a startup based um, in Ithaca. And what they're able to do is use a number of different data sources from satellite imagery, weather data, um, 
and also partnering with, with John Deere to get data off of the tractors as they're moving about in the field. And with all these different data sources aggregated not only for individual farms, but across all the farms in the US that are within the John Deere system. And so when you're able to get that data on that higher level, they're now doing some really interesting things working with the USDA on some um, changes in agricultural policies, um, working with insurances, um, insurers to try to see whether there are ways that they could help um, insurers actually incentivize things like no-till using cover crop because they are able to then do that monitoring and detection on a much more lower cost and on a much more um, constant basis. Then finally, I'm going to talk about one last example, zooming a little bit more globally now. Um, we also work with a startup called Sun Culture. And they actually, they started out being the providers of interesting sets of solar power technology to help smallholder farmers initially in Kenya and now they're expanding throughout the region. And so they have, for example, the most efficient solar powered irrigation system that is deployed that helps their farmers earn 150 US dollars more on average than their neighbors without these systems. Um, and they started to think about how can we actually integrate machine learning technology to help farmers even more. And one thing that they realized is that these farmers needed more accurate weather predictions, not just sort of even on like the countrywide level of Kenya or regional level, but like much more hyper local directly on their farms. And so they're actually using some really sophisticated technical approaches with statistical downscaling that actually helps them get down to the scale of the farms and get some very specific hyper local weather predictions and getting that directly to the farmers through mobile devices. So there's a lot of interesting projects. Come find me afterwards if you want to hear other interesting stories, but we're incredibly excited about the application of technology towards the agriculture space. That's interesting. So I kind of heard that in almost three buckets. Mm -hmm. Data insights on the farm yep. to drive decision making, mm -hmm. maybe help with intensification or maximizing resources, and also uh, measure impact, mm -hmm. right? And that's really an important shift because if if farming in general used to be sort of a checklist of processes, we're really with this new phase about measuring impact. So I'd love to now shift even a little bit wider and, and pivot to Renska. Um, let's widen that lens when we look at impact and regenerative ag. You have investments that really thread the needle across the continuum, starting with on-farm, as we've heard, but also then through human health, and then up to products and services that pull through to the marketplace. In other words, pulling this idea to the marketplace. Can you share with us, Renska, how you define impact in your role, um, both on the investment side and at FS6? Yes, does this work? Yes. Yeah, I have two, so if I'm twice as loud as I normally am, I apologize, but yes. Thank you so much, obviously, really grateful for the opportunity to share our work and be in conversation with all of you today. Um, so, uh, there's a lot that I will hint at or give you kind of a high level around and then, of course, happy to talk um, more at any time um, and in particular about the role of women in agriculture um, and I'm proud to say that we have a portfolio at our accelerator that's almost 50% uh, female founders, so a very important part of this transition to a more sustainable regenerative food system is women. Um, so lots more I can say about that. Um, I also cannot give you the entire history of the world's transitions, um, humanity's transitions through six food systems, but this gives you a sense of how we think about the evolution of the system. So we heard from Robin earlier today about the advent of the intense chemical industrial monocrops production system, and that's about when I started working on these issues a little over 20 years ago in the nonprofit sector. Um, I raised awareness about the problems associated with our food system, and I'm thrilled that I'm now in a chapter of my life where I get to invest and support in the positive forward-looking solutions. Um, and in terms of the way we define impact, we have a number of four, actually, it's a very specific number, um, of impact pillars that we think are really defining this new operating system, in Robin's words, around how we grow, produce, and distribute food. Certainly, sustainable ecosystems is a really critical part of that. So we've heard a lot about climate beneficial food systems um, and regenerative approaches, increasing biodiversity. Um, I'm just going to give you some very quick examples of some of the companies in our portfolio that we have invested in and that we are supporting. Um, and of course, happy to talk more specifically about any of those any other time. Um, this is a company called PastureMap. They are a software um, 
SaaS as a service, uh, software as a service based platform for ranchers to help them um, better monitor their grazing patterns, their livestock inventory, um, and to evaluate the ecological performance of their land. So very specifically connected to soil health um, and regenerative practices. Um, we, as we've heard about and will continue to talk about, um, vibrant farms and smallholder farmers, family farmers, are really the backbone of our food production system. Um, that's where I first started working on this in the upper Midwest in Minnesota, working directly with small-scale farmers. Um, I then worked in Philadelphia to build markets for those small-scale farmers um, and in a global coalition. This is a company, um, Julie is a, a founder, who brought her lengthy expertise in digital marketing to building a platform that can help support local producers um, uh, in the Portland marketplace. So looking forward to talking more about Portland with you. Mm -hmm. um, certainly a model that is really farmer focused, really about um, disintermediating the supply chain, making it much more transparent um, and really putting value back in the hands of producers. Healthy people, we certainly understand and have talked about the relationship between soil health and nutrient density and what that means for the health of our entire com communities and citizens. Um, this is a nonprofit organization that we support in our accelerator. We work with both for-profit and nonprofit entrepreneurs. Um, they have developed a set of standards for institutional procurement. Um, so if you think about LEED for building, um, the Center for Good Food Purchasing has an integrated set of values-aligned purchasing guidelines um, that are, are currently in 15 cities, 32 institutions. Um, I wanna make sure I get the, the statistic right. They redirected $12 million um, into the Los Angeles local food economy in partnership with the Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, really undertapped resource. Um, certainly you know that there's a lot of work happening on the ground here in Sun Valley about what can be done on the institutional level to really support a food system that we're all invested in or want to invest in. Um, and last but definitely not least, justice and fairness. Um, our food <coughs> system is not equitable. It does not prioritize the health and well-being of pretty much anybody in the supply chain, um, including farm workers and food service as two of the most critical areas. Um, this is a company called Sonyar Organics. Um, they were just in our last cohort at Food System 6. Um, they brought into the market a plant-based, organic, um, tortilla chip alternative that is focused on empowering the Latino community. So mm -hmm. they have a partnership with the Latino Community Foundation. They feature Latino leaders on the front of the bags. Um, the mission and inspiration behind this company comes from a Latina-led entrepreneur, Maria, um, who is really inspired about creating this kind of pull through to the marketplace, as you said so well, Kate. Um, really awareness about the entire supply chain. Um, so. Those are four of, of our 29 portfolio companies. Um, really excited to talk more about any of you about the way that we support these entrepreneurs, um, building from the ground up. Um, for any of you that have ever built a company um, is an incredibly difficult proposition and endeavor, um, even more so when you're attempting to change a very difficult, um, very entrenched food system. Um, so would love to talk with any of you about the work that we do to invest in the food system that we are all hoping to see come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Renska. I love that last slide because really if you want to see the front lines of the intersection of human health and planetary health, it's really that portfolio is very much on the front lines of integrating all this. So that's fabulous. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Um, Jen, I'm so excited that you're here. I have seen you on several global chef lists when it comes to sustainability. Truly a pioneer in sustainable seafood. And that's so important because three billion of the world's population rely on ocean protein as their critical source of protein. So keeping that as a viable resource and nutrient base is so important. And Sea sustainable seafood is sort of ground zero where that happens. So uh, what I wanted to ask is, you're at that intersection of supply chain, ensuring supply chain, but then engaging consumers in a, in a public setting. Can you share with us, how, what are your secrets? How do you do that? How do you engage and create something that is so transformative, not just in the restaurant experience, but also for our food system? Um, well. 
Thank you for having me here today. Um, there's no real secret behind it. It's just hard work and education. <laughs> I've, I've always used my, uh, my career as an educational tool for anybody that's coming and dining with me. Um, the Sushi platform is a great platform because it's a one-on-one -on -one interaction and supply chain and sourcing is so important and, and we should know what we put in our bodies at every moment and that is a responsibility for me being a chef and providing the food for everybody. If I can't tell you what it is, I shouldn't be putting it on your plate for you to eat. So education has been the, the most difficult time because you know when you go out to eat, you don't really want to hear about it. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's difficult to understand and how to discuss between the lines of are you here to have a really great meal or are you here to enjoy my entertainment as well? Um, again, the sushi platform is great for that. And that's one of the main reasons that I transitioned into the grocery world. I joined the Boise Co-op um, four, four months ago, uh, and it's for that main reason of that influence of what they do at the co-op is so special, and it's supporting local farmers, it's supporting farmers that are doing great things for the soils and, and all the way down the chain to us. And so it just opens up that platform for me even more to, to have that effect on people. We all have to eat. We don't have that choice. I'll always be employed. It's, it's, a, it's a perfect ecosystem that I've worked out for myself. But as well as what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, how we're feeding our families, how we're supporting our community, and how we're supporting each other. Because we're all a part of a community, and that should be the, the centerpiece of every meal, in my opinion. And I want to make that opinion into everybody else's. Again, educational tool, my job. Um, so working with local farmers, you know, at the co-op, we've supported and started up 225 local farmers and small businesses. We have many platforms inside of our store that's literally opening the doors for so many small companies because we'll always make shelf space to support local. It all revolves around everybody that's sitting in this room and everybody I'm sitting on, on this panel with. Is, it's our support, our own education, ourselves knowing where our food is coming from, how it's affecting our earth, how it's affecting our community, and how it's affecting ourselves and our families. Um, I'm always here to help out and, and push as much of that education out as possible, but I, I always want to put it on the people. As, as consumers, myself included, you know, it's whether we support the good systems or the bad systems and, and understanding those systems and why we support them and sharing that knowledge with everybody else. One of the main reasons that I'm here and everybody else is here today. Um, oh, man. So that's the main thing that I really want to ask and plead for is, you know, let's, let's educate ourselves about what we're doing. Let's keep our local economy healthy and thriving. Let's give back to the farmers. Let's give back to the people that help me put food in front of you. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I think we've hopefully set the stage for you and really given a framework to think about how we transform the food system to create the future we want, what a key role it plays across all of these touch points. And all of our great panelists will be around for follow-up conversations, questions if you saw or heard something and would like to connect deeper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank you. Of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>